Greetings one and all, this is Lloyd Brown and welcome social media family to my vlog. The series called Being Lloyd Brown. Because unlike the perceptions that are flying around, you need to hear it from the horse's mouth himself. And I'm saying what I'm saying with no fear. I'm saying it with a clean heart and a clean conscience because I don't think I can sing another note until you know exactly who I am, where I've been, where I'm at, and where I need to be. So, episode seven, it is 1998, and I have been released from prison. The irony of all ironies at this point was when I was a law-abiding citizen, a single black man in a, being a law-abiding citizen, jumping through hoops to seek some kind of independence where I can get a flat to live, get a job, sustain myself, have some kind of security. I never got that. I never got that. Rehabilitation at that time really meant something because it was mandatory by law for charitable organizations to try and rehabilitate you to begin with and to try and rehouse you so that you do have a decent start in life. Now, the prison population at that time was between 58 and 65,000 people in the United Kingdom. And it's fair to say that a percentage of those people are never going to see road again. They will die in prison. And a percentage will keep going in and out and in and out and in and out. But there is a percentage of people that can be helped. And I was one of them. All I wanted at that point was just for my life to be normal. I've lived for 18 months because I served only half my sentence in prison. I lived in a building where I was banged up for 23 hours a day. I didn't even take exercise got some jobs working in the kitchen, working in general stores, working as a barber, working as a cleaner, just to break the monotony. But I never done exercise. I actually done exercise in the prison. I used to do 500 press ups a day. I used to run the circuit of the wing I was in 25 times a day. I used to do 1,000 steps. Literally just put a chair up, just put a chair, right? Step up, step down, step up, step down, step up, step down. I used to do a thousand of them a day. I was so fit, right? I lived on a diet of porridge and bananas to the point where people were seeing what I was doing and they were doing the same thing as me. And then the governor decided to take porridge and bananas off the diet, off the menu in the kitchen because they were seeing like a whole heap of brothers basically getting bulked up now. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not an unusual thing for prisons to be bulked up anyway, but it was like, 
It was a movement of sorts. And they just took it off the menu. <laughs> which, which was weird. I, just, I thought it was funny. But, um... Being released from prison... Sorry if I'm digressing. But being released from prison, I had the opportunity to be rehoused. I lived in a shared accommodation for 18 months before I was offered one of two flats. A flat just across the way on this estate and this one. The flat across the way was relatively decorated but this flat was a shithole and I chose this flat and the reason why I chose this flat was because it had to be renovated before I moved in here so rather than to live in a flat that was already renovated and the, and the council was not really going to do much to it they had to basically put new things in this flat, which is what they'd done. And I moved in here on August, I think it was August the 10th, 2000. That's when I moved in here. My relationship with my youngest child's mother was just on and off and on and off. And it was punctuated by violence. It was just punctuated by violence. You know. It was punctuated by violence. Because I was angry. I was angry. I was angry with everything. And everybody. Not proud of it. But I'm being honest. And no one on this earth can judge me. The most I can judge me. But nobody on this earth. You can have your perceptions. But. The truth has set me free. And I'd been with this woman for 20, this is 23 years. And she just decided enough was enough. But I was further down the line. But before it got to that point, um, it was 2000 and The music business was buoyed by Jetstar as a record label and a distribution company that was um, embracing talent from here, established talent from Jamaica and what have you. There was a time when Jetstar was like, it was, it was the mecca for a lot of artists just to, just to have material out there doing something. But unbeknown to us of what Jetstar's business practices were, it was to be short-lived. Because by the time I had decided to record properly with Jetstar, I was making hit after hit after hit after hit after hit after hit. And it got to the point I spawned rhythm albums just by the singles I was making. For example, I Know, the Kinky Reggae Rhythm, Fill Me In, the Thunder Rhythm, um, Main Squeeze, the Columbus Rhythm. So I was spawning rhythm albums based upon the strength of my hits. 
but I was still treated like somebody who was claiming job seekers allowance. I was signed to the record company. Donna Marie was signed to the record company. And we was always shoved to the back whenever Beanie Man, Glenn Washington, Luciano, even, even to a degree the Rassites, who are, who's based over here. We would get pushed to the back because of them artists and them artists basically more or less being at the front of the queue in terms of released material. I'm not bad minding nobody when I'm saying this, but I'm just saying that's how the business, that's how it went. That's how it went. So I decided in my infinite wisdom to record two albums. One was called Deep, which was the first album that I worked with Bitty McLean. Um, and that proved to be very successful, but it was the Against the Grain album that was a real milestone for me because I wanted to make an album that sounded like it had major record company backing. So that's what I decided to do. And Bitty taught me a lot. Taught me a lot about music production. And within those, so I'm just going to, yeah, just looking at the, the timer. And based upon his knowledge of engineering and music production, I've took those things and retained those things in my head to what, was I, what I was about to do in future. But in between that time and with main squeeze, now let's rewind. In between that time and working alongside Lloyd Campbell from Joe Fraser Records, when I recorded a song called Humanity Part Two, and then a song called Bless Me, which was the, it was the beginnings of my profile being, um, being noticed in America. And even before then, you know, there was, there was some DJs like Ito K and Brixton Hitman who were based in, um, based in California at the time, you know, they were aware of my works and what have you, and they would be promoting my works, but, but, but the synergy, the, the, the synergy wasn't, wasn't, um, it was, it didn't manifest at that time. It was just like a cult artist with a cult album being played in a different territory. And that was basically it. Um, but it wasn't until Main Squeeze, after all of that, that really, really, really raised my profile worldwide. I started getting work in Europe. I started getting work in America. And it was beautiful. It was a beautiful time. It was hard work, but it was beautiful. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy in the slightest. And I think me being out there and people's perceptions of me being out there, thinking that, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm out there kicking it and I'm flossing it and I'm doing, I was sleeping on my brethren's sofas out there. I was sleeping on people's floors out there just to have somewhere to put my head, you know? And that was before I got any kind of management. I had done quite a few shows worldwide by then. And then I thought, okay, this is the start of something big for me. And this was like 2000, yeah, 2004. That's when I started touring hard but then there was yet more trauma to come of which I will tell you about in another video so I want to thank you guys for watching
Thank you guys for stopping by. And as always, you've done know the coup. Whatever you do, people, please abstain from foolishness. Whatever it's your own, confront it, deal with it, push it one side and move on. Live on, live up. Simple as that. So until I catch you on the next one, people, please stay blessed. Magan.